And another round of applause, please, for Shuma UK. Thank you so much. Um, that certainly woke everybody up and ready for our next conversation, which is going to be about music and psychedelics. And we'll welcome Eileen Hall to the stage. So thank you, Jimmy, for the invitation to do this conversation tonight, which I'm really excited about. Um, Alexander Tanous is an incredible craftsman and a master of what he does, which has been to host group and individual psychedelic ceremonies and gatherings for uh, many years. He's a musician and a composer, an ethnomusicologist, and can count the McKennas as some of his biggest fans. He, has, uh, he turned his attention towards the science of sound many years ago, and especially uh, what, it, what it can bring to the psychedelic experience. Now, we, we see that uh, the scientific research being carried out uh, in the realm of psychedelics for uh, therapy has been capturing mainstream media attention. Some of you will see it in papers, or maybe Michael Pollan's latest his book, uh, How to Change Your Mind, as well as his Netflix documentary. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're, they're being hailed as the next big breakthrough in our, for our mental health crisis. Uh, we see them helping people break addictions, uh, depression, anxiety, and all sorts of other benefits are coming alongside of them. Now, uh, a little bit about myself um, and why it is that I've been brought in to talk about this topic. So I am uh, the founder of Tayos, which is an organization looking to protect endangered habitats in my home country of Ecuador. I work with indigenous uh, groups to do so. And um, recently, um, I took uh, John Hopkins, the music composer, to a cave in the Amazon of Ecuador, which my father explored looking for ancient treasures alongside Neil Armstrong and the British government. Now, uh, John Hopkins created a beautiful piece of music, a 20 minute long track that was then became part of the inspiration for his brand new album, Music for Psychedelic Therapy. Now we wanted to use the music as a bridge between the spirit of this place and, and the audiences that we want to bring this uh, story to, which has already expanded the scope of our project so beautifully just through the power of music. Now we also managed to take Mendel Kalin, the founder of a psychedelic music startup Wave Paths with us, and it's his recordings that you find within uh, this piece and the album. Now, those of you that were here in, our, in the last event um, will have seen my talk about the art that I created for John's album um, that gets to support his campaign, which has really been uh, inspired by the, the spaces of consciousness, psychedelia, the dream world. Um, and um, for me personally, I've been using uh, psychedelics and music for my own healing and transformation and creative journey for over a decade now. Uh, when my father died in 2008 and co I continued his work, I was uh, instantly actually introduced to David Luke, who's one of the Greenwich researchers. And then following on from that, I became really good friends with Catherine McLean, who at the time was leading the Magic Mushroom Studies for End of Life alongside Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins University. Now, she's the one that uh, firstly introduced me to this idea of taking agency and responsibility for my own healing journey at home with music. Uh, she was becoming quite critical of the clinical model with its big pharma capitalist kind of machine that was coming uh, our way. And so it was her idea that if people could do these, uh, these powerful substances at home with the right setting and music, then we could have an alternative to paying thousands of pounds for a clinical session because she found that it was actually safe enough for a lot of us to do that. And so I began my own explorations alongside her mentorship into, into try this out. And sure enough, music became my absolute guide in that space, so much so that later I was able to let go of using mind-altering substances and I could, I could access similar insights uh, through music alone. Um, we also know through uh, the knowledge that's pouring through from the space of indigenous communities that 
uh, they've been using, you know, ancestral shamanic practices have been using mind-altering plant medicines alongside music and sound for hundreds and thousands of years. And so many of these tribes would not dare to do a ceremony without music as they believe it's as important as the plant medicines or the psychedelics themselves. Um, they believe it's an emotional bridge or a, dr uh, a bridge between the dream world and this reality. And through my uh, friendships, and again, just kind of swimming in the psychedelic research space, uh, I find out that all these researchers also valued music as much um, in terms of holding space for people and creating uh, a way for them to be guided emotionally into the deeper parts of their psyche where they can access transformation, healings, and insights. So for me, all of this ended up culminating in my art. Um, you see some of it there. Um, and last time I also spoke about this concept of the numinous sono field, which is the name I coined for the sentient sea of sensations that's created when we enter a psychedelic container and the intelligence of music meets human cognition. And that's where we find these doors start opening towards more insight, more of our intuition and imagination is uh, woken up. Uh, we have uh, more creativity and problem solving coming through. And more and more studies are starting to, to find all sorts of interesting things out around. <laughs> Sorry, we're running late. We're going to have to, um, ah. Um, it's okay. Um, uh, just to add to the tech issues, sorry. We're going to have to end this. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Okay. Okay. Okay, crisis averted. Sorry. I we were running a bit late. Um okay, so without further ado, um we have Alexander joining us tonight. Um, can you hear me okay still? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, now we can't hear you. Uh, can you unmute yourself, um, Alexander? Okay. Yep. Unmute it. <laughs> hey, okay. We're good. So before I ask your first question, just one last thing is, is really uh, we want to touch on the topic of the intelligence of music within the psychedelic space. And, you know, I really feel that the climate crisis that we're in, all these different crises that we seem to be in are also a crisis of consciousness. And so uh, I really feel strongly that the moment that we can start evolving, changing, beautifying, poetifying uh, our inner landscapes and our dream world, then we're going to be able to translate that into this outer space. I've worked in activism and conservation for over a decade, and the biggest breakthroughs I have seen in making a change has been when you change the way you see reality from within. And so I, I believe that psychedelics hold so much potential when, when used responsibly and maturely. And I'm so glad that Jimmy was able to bring Alexander to us today because of his breadth and width of knowledge has blown me away. And I really hope everyone can research more of his work beyond this event. So, Alexander. Um, firstly, I would like you to please share with everyone uh, the way in which you share um, your music with uh, groups and individuals. What's the musical setup and also why you believe music is such an important part of the psychedelic experience? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you, Eileen, Jimmy, and uh, the Future of Sound for bringing me here to be with all of you. I'm sorry I can't be with all of you in person to experience it there physically, uh, but 
thank you and thanks to everyone in the audience. I wish I can see you <laughs> and talk to you and to the Barbican crew. Um, basically, the setting that I created to communicate very important knowledge that I came across in my work, in my field work, in my research, in my personal quest, in my education, in my work with thousands of people, um, in this research that I started on the therapeutic and esoteric properties of sound about 23 years ago, um, is something I call sound meditation, which is uh, uh, an experience where the individual is, is briefed in with what the, the structure is, what is really at work, because I wanted to understand sound and the use of sound through three different perspectives, the Western scientific, academic, Eastern philosophical and shamanic society beliefs. And I became deeply interested uh, in the combination of sound, music. What I mean by sound is the place where that power that music has uh, comes from, from the harmonic series. It's a, it's a deep rabbit hole to plunge into right now, but people should research the harmonic series. It's pure harmony, basically. These are the notes that we hear when uh, someone plays a gong, uh, singing bowls in, in what is now known in uh, sound healing or sound bath, not an appropriate, appropriate terms to use, uh, but this is pure harmony. So basically, I wanted to understand what this powerful, powerful combination using the two most powerful tools, which are sound, music is included in sound, and psychedelics, with a great attention to the presence of the mind, to what we bring to the experience, the phenomenological aspect of being, the mindset, attention, intention, will, awareness, logic, discernment, reasoning, intuition, imagination, all these things. So I communicate this to the people I'm working with so that they work with me. And the mindset is very important. I stated some of these aspects of the mindset, which are about 14. The setting, the context, um, bringing into meditative and or contemplative and or mindful state presence, breathing exercises, visualizations and guided visualization, toning uh, and vocalization, working with overtone emitting instruments. These are the, the harmonic uh, rich instruments, gongs, singing bowls, discs, bells that humans everywhere in the world resort to using every time they're involved in using sound as a therapeutic modality. Judicious and equanimous listening, very important. Who is listening? What is going on in the mind of the person? All factors stimuli and in uh, places where it's legal to use psychedelics, I do use them, but I also use all of the setting with just sound by itself and it's very powerful. So the whole point is to allow people to work with sound, work with what they bring to the experience to go deep into the self. Now, what happens when we take psychedelics and sound, what I've realized in my field work as an ethnomusicologist, as a person deeply interested in this uh, journey for, for self-healing, revealing, rehabilitation, empowerment, understanding, and so on and so forth, it's also an education, is that um, we seem to disconnect from the default mode network, what we're starting to call now, the default mode network is the egoic mind, the concept of the self that starts to happen in the brain, as we go through parental imprinting, education, indoctrination, society, culture, religions as operating systems, uh, and we develop a notion of the self and these perceptions. When we disconnect from the default mode network, we seem to connect to inner powers within us. Sometimes we can disconnect a little bit, sometimes a lot, and sometimes completely disconnect where we lose the concept of the self. This is what's called an ego death. That means uh, the person is having an experience without, without having the identity of the self. It's just the person becomes one with the experience. There's no more an observer, no one labeling. And this is where mystical experience is likely to happen. So basically what I believe is going on is that uh, music and sound that humans use everywhere in religious ceremonies, all religious ceremonies in Judaism, Christianity, in Islam, in Eastern philosophies, in, in shamanic societies, in indigenous ceremonies for healing, trance, possession, in sports games, in, on TV, in commercials, everywhere, right? It's the most indispensable art. There must be a reason, a very valid reason that humans with enormous amount of intuitive intelligence are resorting to using that. What is behind this power is the harmonic series, but at the end you're using acoustics, which is um, the, the physics of sound. 
Acoustics is a field in physics that is involved in understanding uh, and researching sound, vibration, and the behavior of sound. So this seems to impact our entire body, um, the brain, the heart, subtle energy, the, the, the vagus nerve, and the autonomic nervous system helping us disengage from sympathetic to parasympathetic. So music has an ethos that distinguishes quality, character, personality, uh, and it creates pathos within us, and that is a level of reality. It, it evokes feelings, emotions, thoughts, sensations, and this is why we love music, is to make us change our mind, make us change who we are, how we're feeling, um, because it's physics. I believe when this happens, we disconnect from the default mode network and we start to tap into various archetypes. An archetype is an instinctual energy form and the basic building blocks of human psychology, a certain way of being, certain personality, the healer archetype, the teacher archetype, and so on and so forth. And we start to observe in this experience the unraveling of the subconscious mind through what I believe is happening is metacognition. Now, the indigenous people, which we are very grateful that they kept these traditions alive, but it doesn't mean that what they're talking about is the only thing that's going on. They don't know a lot of things that we know, just like they know a lot that we don't know. It's very important to take a syncretic approach nowadays and to create our own cosmological model, not taking this cosmological model out of its context when we lose everything or most important things and it becomes dogmatic. So metacognition is the awareness of an understanding of, of um, one's own thought processes. The indigenous people tell you that's the plant talking to you. But guess what? We take psilocybin, which is the active psychedelic psychotropic substance in mushrooms, which are not plant, they're fungi. Um, if you take it made in a lab, the same thing happens. So it's in the molecule that has the spirit. And this basically allows us to connect to gnosis, embodied knowledge, knowledge of the heart, experiential knowledge, which we need greatly because we're in a day where, or eras where we have focused more on what the ancient Greeks called episteme, which is conceptual knowledge reached through reason and investigation, and no longer the balance with gnosis, which is non-conceptual direct knowledge uh, reached through personal experience of the divine truth. So this is knowledge of the heart, knowledge that expand through an experience. And then we connect to the logos. That's the most important part. The logos is the place where the concept of God comes from. Uh, logos in ancient Greek has several meanings, word, discourse, plan, reason, ratio, mediation, order, pattern, harmony. Um, and the logos uh, in, in, in Greek philosophy and theology is the universal ordering principle, the divine reason implicit in the cosmos, ordering it and giving it form and meaning. It is a true universal language expressed basically in, in mathematics and mathematical constants. These are numbers that never change like pi and phi in sacred geometry, energy patterns, frequency, harmony. And we experience it as sound, music, sacred geometry. And, and basically, we go back to the essence of the self, to source. That's what I believe is going on. Well, thank you. Experience. And, and this brings me on to my next question, which is the, the really interesting shift that's happening in how we view our well-being or our health is that we're going from this model of there's a problem and here's a pill that's gonna solve it or here's medicine that's gonna fix it, here's whatever, into this idea that each of us are responsible for our own healing, for our own gnosis, for opening our cognition, our hearts and our knowledge in a way that's gonna be uh, bringing forth that, that, uh, that transformation. And so um, you talk a lot about people taking agency of their journey. So we've got about five minutes left. So I'd love for you to share with our audience this idea of you being the creator of your experience and, and transforming yourself from being someone that consumes the world to then becoming this creator of your world. Um, and I love the idea of this like domestic spirituality that each of us can access through uh, being educated in this manner and and I really believe uh, in in kind of 
bringing this to the public attention so that each of us um, doesn't just give our power away to, to the establishment so much. So two things, yeah, about taking agency for your own journey, and lastly, the dangers of growing a psychedelic ego. Um, yeah, we've got about five minutes left. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 that's all. I need about five months. So I'm going to combine both together and amalgamate them. Um, so this is very, very important in to, to take agency, to realize that maybe there's another way to interpret what the indigenous people are talking about. They live in the world of uh, the plants, so the plant is the main authority, but what they say doesn't always resonate with us because we experience a different reality. Everything is different. Um, so it's very important to understand also where we come from. We come from religions and uh, the, in the ancient days, the, the nobilities, the royalties and, and the aristocracy that created reality. And then religions came and created more reality. Do this, don't do that. And if you get out of line, there is fear and guilt that <laughs> people are threatened with, you're not gonna go to heaven. And then political systems and then the media and then the Silicon Valley. So we're indoctrinated and, and we lost our power. And the tendency is to give our power away and wait for a prophet, for an extraterrestrial, for a guru, for a shaman, for a healer to heal us. It's very important to realize that this may not be the truth, that it's about agency and changing these perceptions and start to think and experience differently and pay attention to what is being unraveled in the experience uh, and not to... Uh, believe someone that's telling us, oh, this is what's going on. It's not you. That voice is not your higher self's voice. It's the plan talking to you. Well, this is not what scientific studies are showing us. So it's important to realize that it's about inner work. It's the inner work that counts is to let, it, let go of all these detrimental things that we went through in parental imprinting and our parents do their best. Maybe they, they did this to us because this is what has been done to them. So they don't have the vocabulary and kids don't come with a manual. So um, it's important to disconnect from these traumas, to let go our attachment to shame and guilt, to fear, to anger, resentment and self-victimization. All of this is inner psychology. It's, it's the, the person becoming his or her own, own um, therapist, healer, teacher, and to realize that it's about creating the balance between the inner feminine and the masculine. Feminine here, it's the yin and yang, basically. Feminine, the positive side of feminine, positive side of masculine, they need to be in, in balance, and they are not in balance, and we focus on the negative side of both. The feminine positive side is love, compassion, empathy, kindness, and, and, and intuition, imagination. And the negative side is lying, cowardice, and uh, passive aggressive. And masculine is logic, discernment, reasoning. Again, here we have a balance between gnosis and episteme. And also the masculine has a negative side, violence, anger, resentment, retaliation, etc. So by, by gaining back agency, working with powerful tools and the knowledge of how to use these powerful tools, we at the same time have to be aware that uh, there are some pitfalls to working with powerful tools and psychedelics and sound are the most powerful tools that I believe humans use to create something we call shamanism, which is found everywhere in the world. And uh, the, the, on top of the list is ego inflation. The person becomes ego inflated. Um, other byproduct is spiritual materialism, spiritual bypassing, pathological altruism. I'm saying this with zero judgment. It's just I'm making an observation because we're at an age where we're dealing with the most powerful tools. We're gravitating toward what is most impactful to our consciousness. So we better do the work the right way and not only think we're doing the work because that's the tendency. Other byproducts are latent narcissistic, narcissistic spirituality and uh, boasted humanism, messianism becoming, you know, messiah figure. Um, going native, starting to behave, talk, walk, dress like a native when the person is not a native. This is an association and, and there's this virtue signaling as well and wanting to gain um, legitimization. It's based on insecurities that we have within us. We start to imitate others and next thing we become the other. 
there is also delusional behavior and something word that I coined, which is monobiblosis, which is the disease of becoming an expert after having read only one book, becoming a shaman after having had, uh, <laughs> thank you. Becoming a shaman after had five ayahuasca ceremonies or becoming an expert after having uh, listened to one podcast or read one bad website. These are real things that people suffer from and we're not talking about it. And it's compassionate to talk about it because we want people to be empowered and not like, I'm your healer, I'm your shaman. What does that mean? Healers don't heal. They create the conditions for healing. They give the tools, they support the person. They do amazing things, but they don't heal at the end. It's the person's agency. Doing what, letting go, shifting the noise to signal ratio, basically letting go of noise and the chaos that we create and fall back into self-love. And the absence of self-love is the root cause of all of our issues. Thank you so much, Alexander. Um, Thank you. Brilliant. I, I encourage everyone again to follow this man's work. He's held space for thousands of people and there's loads of resources online. Please educate yourselves. Don't just go and take drugs and psychedelics without learning how to do this properly and acquaint yourselves with music and, and learn to have your own way for it to support your life because it can become this healing force for the rest of your life um, and to help us birth this new dream together. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you very much. Thank you.